Okay, so I was doing a master's in environmental studies on a solar technology, a prototype solar technology. And that solar technology brought me down to Mexico and nobody really wanted to buy the solar technology. And we were roasting our first coffee and cacao in, the, in uh, Oaxaca and in the Lacandone jungle of Chiapas with pure sunlight. And somewhere along the way, after learning how to roast coffee, I was invited to make some chocolate with a Zapotec grandmother in a little village in Oaxaca. And she taught me her great grandmother's traditional chocolate recipe. And that was my initiation to chocolate making. And what I found out was everybody wanted to eat the chocolate and drink the coffee, but not everyone wanted to buy the technology, even as ecologically sound and, and beneficial as it was. And so Chocolate Soul was born. And Chocolate Soul uh, at its core was about ecological regeneration. It started with clean tech and it, it really moved into including agriculture. And so today, because our, my, my co-presenter is Ms. Sarah Bacher and because I love the work that she and Henry do on regenerative ag, uh, I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about that particular question about how chocolate soul is a social enterprise. So the question is, how can chocolate be a powerful vehicle for regenerative agriculture? Well, the, first of all, the regenerative ecology of indigenous forest gardens is amazing. Many of you have heard of the three sisters, which is the squash, the beans, and the corn. But what many people have not heard of is the three pillars of the forest, the cacao, the vanilla, and the achiote. And that's a really important um, reference, not just to a specific matrix of plants and polycultures growing together, but of the whole concept of a forest garden permaculture, an indigenous polyculture of the forest that really created an abundance in a cornucopia. And so a lot of the recipes that we develop around our gold medal world level and, and America's level winning gold uh, metal jaguar chocolate have been around celebrating the ingredients of the indigenous forest garden and really using the chocolate as a vehicle to celebrate that polyculture and working in, with amazing indigenous producers and elders and agroecological you know community level animators in Oaxaca in Chiapas but also in the Dominican Republic and also in Ecuador but there's another way that the chocolate can be a vehicle, and that is it's a vehicle for that dialogue to happen between the, you know, indigenous and non-indigenous and intercultural dialogue. And that's something that's really uh, important for us as well. Uh, as we you go spiraling down in the in the presentation here, you know, there's. Let's go to the next slide here. Uh, you know, the food forest is a symbol. And, and, yet, and when I say symbol, it's really hard because a symbol is not reducible to a simplified term. So uh, Wayne Roberts in the No Nonsense Guide to World Food talked about how in forest gardens, we get food, fuel, and fiber on page 69. Perfect. I was just in, as I was waiting for this to start, I grabbed it off my shelf here. A multi purpose, multi use forest managed as a grocery, a pharmacy, a hardware, and a clothing store without walls provides security for the very people likely to face hunger. Food, fiber for clothes, fiber for building, materials for crafts, fuel, medicine, fodder for livestock. It's a one stop foraging. It's a the, the forest garden is a symbol in that sense of that agroecological approach. But from another perspective, cultures and farmers who are willing to plant trees in whose shade they'll never stand or whose fruits they may never get the full bounty from are expressing a vision on a different level and a different scale. And that longer term vision of service and, and the symbol of a tree for that 
is so important. And it is the basis of that, a resilient polyculture, a resilient permaculture. Uh, you know, a forest garden is not just functional, it's also beautiful. A forest garden is not just about a utilitarian approach, even though as useful as we can see it is providing food, fuel, and fiber, it's also a commons. It's a place where people gather. It's a place where women can be foraging in the forest and their kids are playing alongside of them. It's a, I've seen and experienced how it is a teaching place for language and culture in Indigenous communities. And, you know, for, for us, the forest garden is really a powerful vehicle. So Chelsea, you can just kind of like flip through those slides as you as you see fit and and people can get a sense of that. But I wanted to to then just kind of talk about another side of how chocolate can be a vehicle and a powerful symbol for you know a social enterprise. And it has to do with chocolate as a health food and a medicine. And chocolate, most people think of as a candy. It's not. It is one of the, it is the highest source of antioxidants of any food known to humans. It has over 1,200 chemical compounds. And I just was reading an article uh, before we started this presentation in a neuroscience magazine, fascinating article about how cacao that is high in flavanols and that is to say that is not overly processed and that is to say is not subject to high heat and high shear steel cutting so stone grinding is better and not subject to vast amounts of time processing so low time of grinding is important is a really exigent way for brain oxygenation and cognition function and it's fascinating how, um, you know, cacao really does, for me, the more I research it, the more I dig into it, the more I rediscover, and the more powerful a symbol it becomes. Only thing that will make our chocolate better is continuing to integrate more local, sustainable, and regenerative foods into our chocolates, like maple to make a forest garden of the North combined with the forest garden of the South chocolate bar. And that's why one of my favorite selling uh, uh, chocolate bars of all time was the bird sanctuary cacao from the Dominican Republic, the, uh, for the migratory Bicknell thrush. We bring the maple together with the cacao and a touch of sea salt to symbolize the trans local birds. And are the birds local to Quebec and Vermont and New Brunswick, or are they local to the Dominican Republic or is not, the birds migration, an example of that you know, symbolism that we need to look at and, and understand a little bit more clearly. And how does that connect to questions around food miles and awareness around food miles and cosmopolitan migratory practices, not only amongst nature, but also amongst humans. And, and so, you know, we also have been working with some amazing farmers um, in Chatham, Kent, growing hullless pumpkin seeds, doing soil mound um, experiments. Uh, tomorrow I'm dropping off uh, 500 pounds of uh, biochar that we made from some waste cacao to Pagonis uh, live bait and soil makers. And we're making a special chocolate soil uh, carbon and nitrogen rich uh, bags and then we're and we're actually using a uh, double waste burlap sacks and creating mounds for a uh you know a hundred square foot prototype forest garden mound at a little farm in hamilton and so we are having so much fun uh exploring these different things that we can do while using the chocolate as the the vehicle the vessel the focus the sharpened point of what we're doing and like the wonderful and esteemed miss bacher who i'm happy to hear business flourish during covid we uh, pivoted in the winds of change ourselves and we benefited uh from you know you know our customers 
the people for whom the custom and the habit of enjoying a good cup of coffee and a delicious, nutritious bite of chocolate that we are able to share with them in a way that minimizes food miles and minimizes packaging. And uh, we had an excellent year, uh, a, a challenging and stressful year and a, a year full of a lot of uncertainty, but uh, a year that forced us to take five years of development and crunch it into one. And, you know, that's where we, we see ourselves continuing to grow and bringing together sustainable polyculture field crops together with regenerative agriculture, forest garden crops to make eco-gastronomic chocolate foods in ways that balance the tension of learning and earning of our workers and our supply chain people in healthy ways. And for me, profit and purpose, there is a tension there. There is an irresolvable tension there. And so as entrepreneurs, and I like to think of myself more as an ecopreneur, uh, we have to find balance and that balance will shift. So, you know, in a company, you have to, to ask yourself, are you a research think tank or are you a social enterprise? And Chocolate Soul, I had to realize after about six years in, was no longer just a research project. It had to become a, a focused earning project in which research could play a part. And the value proposition of ecological regeneration and working in an intercultural way with indigenous communities and, and cutting out all the intermediaries, that was the, those were the value propositions. But then the value production was we had to find a way to produce that chocolate in a way that respected the, the matrix of financial fitness demands in order to be viable and successful. Another tension. Four minutes left. Michael. Great. Another tension uh, that we had was the tension between creativity and focused productivity. So the creativity is something that really makes this kind of work sustainable uh, for the worker, but having a focused and smart productivity go hand in hand with that is what makes the social entrepreneurs successful. And then finally, and this one was a hard one, is we, we had to, to learn to balance initiative taking and leadership by example with management and having clear focused deliverables. And so, you know, Chaco Soul for us and the Chaco Solistas has really been a, a growth mentality learning community that has become a social enterprise organization. And in the future, we see it evolving into two things, the Chaco Soul Regeneration Foundation and then the Chaco Soul Social Enterprise. But the goal is to continue to find creative and dynamic organizational functional models that allow us to do that. And as I was having a wonderful conversation yesterday with Ms. Sally Miller, who was gracious enough to help me work through some ideas and, and, and give some encouragement, you know, that sometimes not deciding which form to take and sitting with that question for months or even years can be one of the most generative ways of coming up with these new ideas and these new formats. So if there's anyone listening thinking, you know, you know, I'm onto something, but I really have to make a decision, you know, make the next best right decision, but sometimes holding off on making huge decisions while inspiration and uh, practice continue to kind of lead the way on a daily, uh, you know, that, that can be really helpful because I can tell you right now, if, you know, 20 years ago when I started this research in 2000, uh, someone had asked me to come up with a plan, you know, this, it, it would never have happened. And so, you know, it's really, you know, in, in trying to find that tension and that balance between profit and purpose, you know, the fuel has to be your passion and your inspiration and your vision, but you, you also have to balance that with your daily bread. 
and 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 being and and being focused and being disciplined and having you know uh, healthy rituals and financial fitness rituals and organizational rituals and communication tools and keep on renewing that keep on uh, renewing that right now we are in the in the yearly renewal of our working accords and visions and so with those words I come back to the words of gratitude and I come back to you know the the thing that I think is most important and that is get in relationship with the land get in relationship with the food and get in relationship with your daily work so that it is a vehicle for your creativity and if you do that you'll be part of the change that the world so desperately needs. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, so much for that wonderful presentation. Really quick enough. Um, Sally's now just pulling up the slide um, um, of our funders and partners. Um, always we're um, showing kindness and gratitude and so thankful for for, for all these organizations on the board here and all the individuals that have supported the journey of the Fair Finance Fund to date. We absolutely couldn't have done it uh, without everyone. Uh, we as well, um, although we're a nonprofit, we, we do have to think about um, our function of uh, profit and purpose uh, to, to meet our goals. Um, and so we, we keep a lean organization and we all work really hard and, and we, we could not do it without our partners and our individuals uh, for all the successes we have to date. Thank you.